for violinists on Thursday, June 4th. We started this two months ago. It's unbelievable to me that we've been at it for that long. And I am so excited to uh, introduce our guest today, who is Suvin Kim. And before I do that, though, I just have to say that this week was a rough one, I think probably for all of us. And it was hard to know whether to just keep going on doing violin classes in the wake of what's been going on in the world. And um, I had a long think about it and decided that this is the most inclusive thing I can think of doing. We have people from all over the world playing and teaching and listening, and it's available out there for everyone to, to, to um, enjoy at their leisure. And I will just say one word uh, in response to things that have been happening, which is, if you can, vote. So that's my, my plea to the world. And given that, now we're going to talk about music and have a little bit of a respite from, from things that may be troubling. And uh, to introduce Suvin, I thought I'd tell you a few stories. The first is that, um, well, my favorite Suvin story, it's really hard to pick because I have so many of these little vignettes that just are stuck in my head and he has no idea what I'm gonna say. And I think the first one might surprise him. So my quartet, the Cypress Quartet, was on tour in Philadelphia, and um, the other violinist was was uh, crashing at Suvin's house. And I remember arriving one morning to meet meet up with them and have coffee or do whatever it was we were going to do. And one or the other of us said, hey, Suvin, what are you working on today? Because he was practicing. And his answer was, and I'll never forget this, G. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on G. I believe I thought, that. I believe that story. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds about right. <laughs> I'll never, <laughs> ever forget that because Suvin is an absolutely phenomenal virtuoso violinist, and yet G was the focus of his day. Another moment I'll never forget about Suvin was in El Paso, Texas, where we were at a, um, a festival together, and the festival had organized in the hotel where we were all staying had organized like a, a hotel room to be our our crash pad it's where we could all go hang out and eat potato chips and I don't know what we were doing in there but Subin came in one night and said I really need to play these six Paganini caprices through <laughs> and it was like two in the morning I think <laughs> and he did he just played them because he was about to play all 24 in a recital Another absolutely insane recital that I went to that he played was in Menlo, uh, music at Menlo, where he played like the entire violin repertoire in the course of an afternoon. And these are things I'll just never forget about Suvin. Extraordinary musicianship, amazing violinistic, just everything, and so humble and, and kind. And I can't wait to hear what he has to say for our students today. Um, our first performer is Libby Sherwood. She is going to play the last movement of, uh, sorry, not the last movement, the um, jig of the Bach uh, D minor partita. And she sent us a video to see now. Just before Libby plays, can I just, before I, I forget, thank you, Cecily, it's very, very kind of you. I just wanted to, to say, if you can't vote, I wouldn't mind if you try to vote anyway. <laughs> just go ahead. <laughs> and, um, and I did move on from G at some point, and F sharp became a real issue for me for many years. So F sharp was my favorite note to practice for a long time after that, Cecily. So well, that, that's that's good to know. I'm not there yet. That's, that's you know, several steps forward. Okay. All so right. let's listen to Libby. Thank you. 
Bravo! Do we all clap? Or we give we give signs? I see. Okay. Where is Libby on my screen? There is Libby. So Cecily, should I go on ahead? Maybe Cecily's not yes, there. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah. First of all, bravo, Libby. I should. I don't know if if Cecily posted this anywhere, but where are you from? Um, I'm from Leicester originally, but I'm in Devon at the moment. Oh, wonderful. And how old are you, if you don't mind me, my asking? Um, just turned 23. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Well, it's very um, beautiful playing, beautiful, elegant uh, music making. And is this, is this jig something that you have performed quite a bit at this um, point? No, I've actually just been learning it. I started it maybe three or four weeks ago. Oh my gosh, that's great. It's really, really great. Great start. Um, this is, uh, uh, you're, I mean, you're managing it amazingly. It just will get easier as, as time goes on. Um, it's really deceptive. I mean, it doesn't seem like it should be that difficult for the left hand. Uh, a lot of string crossings going for the right hand. Uh, but it, this jig for our brain 
never becomes easy. Um, I mean, it's always slightly stressful on the edge, and there's just something amazingly intricate about these figures. Um, and then there's just the momentum of the music; it just doesn't doesn't let you breathe, really. Um, nor should it, really, <coughs> except maybe the, the first cadence. Um, and and uh, and you did that beautifully. But so the the timing of things is something that I think, first of all, you could just think about, I think a certain perspective will just, actually, I, I have a feeling with you that everything will fall into place. Um, the, the timing that you are, um, and the time that you're taking occasionally to emphasize, especially seems like to emphasize a, a harmony or to emphasize a certain voice, maybe if there was a very clear bass voicing between the end of one measure and the next harmony, um, it was really wonderful. Uh, just occasionally you would lose the overall momentum because of it. And that's very, it can happen very easily. It's very, very delicate. So it's just really keeping a bigger perspective from just a little bit further away um, while you are taking time and breathing. Then there will be a little bit, you, inevitably you'll, you'll set up the timing a little bit differently you'll catch up, it'll be a little bit more of a, of a rubato. Um, so there are certainly certain cadential points where they can sit a little bit, um, but then there are others that just keep going forward, right? It's as if it were going to pause. Um, and uh, so it would be great actually for, for everyone to, it would be interesting to hear even the first time. I wouldn't be surprised if she just everything's just better, it just falls into place. This is also the kind of thing that happens as you're less stressed about the details. <coughs> and there are so many um, little technical details. Actually, I was curious to ask you, what concerns you the most at this point? Like when you're doing that run through, what is occupying you the most? Um, I think that's, uh, it's an interesting question. I think there's in two parts. One, the first, the most important part to me is musically what I want to do. And it's, it is difficult because it's, there's so much momentum all the way through, as you say. Um, but there are lots of patterns and it's working out when to go through all of the patterns and when to take some more time. So there's that. And then also the like string, string crossings and trying to make a nice, not scratchy sound all the time. It's all just, oh, you're, yeah, so. you're managing all of those things really well, all at once. And um, it might be that in your practicing now, um, uh, when we're getting ready for a performance, because we're trying to put it all together and hopefully you don't have to perform it again tomorrow. And you can take a little time to isolate one of those things at a time. And I would say definitely the things like the string crossings, um, it would be great to make that more second nature um, so that you're not as worried about it. Um, it'll just be planning ahead slightly arm positions and, and things like we can look a little bit at that. Um, shifting, there, there are some, the, some of these shifts, they only go probably first to third position, but they feel like they're so far, right? <laughs> they're happening so quickly, especially if it's going over, a, if it's, there's a string crossing involved as well. Um, so those few places you also want to address. Some, um, we'll look at some fingerings that I think might help relieve you. Um, but yeah, then it's great to, to kind of zoom out a little bit and be able to see a little bit more of structure. Before I forget, the, the other thing that I think would be, um, could add actually a lot of, of dimension to your performance is harmonically to respond more to some of the major keys. Um, that they're, I mean, essentially, this is an intense, dark, almost could be fiery jig. Um, but there are just a few moments of beauty of, of uh, you know, pe just sort of peeking through, little bit of, of hope, maybe, kind of desperate hope. And then it's already, it's very fleeting and it's gone and all of a sudden we go in this more turbulent direction again. So the first, first place really being the, 
especially when it's slurred. So if those slurs, I think in a movement like this, when there's so many separate notes, and then these occasional slurs, um, those slurs have a very expressive role at, at actually, I think in, in every single point in this movement. Um, so to just feel that just for, for a moment. If you are vibrating, that might be maybe where you particularly vibrate once on, on those first notes to warm it up. But let's first, let's listen to Libby a little bit, um, play from the beginning. And in terms of timing, let's not think about any one individual note or even a group of three notes. Um, but let's see if you can just go by the harmonies that you can time time according to the harmonies. And if you, okay, if, if something happens memory wise because you're you're zooming out too much, it's fine for now. You know, it's good for us to see. Cecily, you have a, okay. Cecily, maybe I can mute myself um, when she when she's playing so I can unmute myself too. <laughs> okay, okay, great, Libby. I, I, I know we're putting you on the spot here. You are, you're just playing, probably not, not that warmed up now after, after 20 minutes, but, um, but you certainly had a momentum. It probably was rushing more than you wanted, right? Based, based on when I heard your, your earlier performance. Um, but let's look a little more closely at this now. Um, so that you don't worry so much about, about the timing of that as you do about landing here on time when we change chords. So that you really think of just these, in, in that much that we played, just four pillars, these four chords, and that in between you can be freer, it's, it's fine, but you don't want the second beat to come, the, the second chord to come late because we took time in a, in a way that was too much perhaps, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, if, if those chords start to come in late, then the whole thing gets a little heavy. And if they come in early, then it feels like we're, we're rushing. Okay. On the other hand, if the, the second bar and the fourth bar um, within the same harmony, if those are not totally rhythmic on time, it's okay. I don't think we as listeners perceive it quite as much. Okay, Actually, as an experiment, can we do this once? Um, it's going to feel quite weird because rhythm, so we're not going to have the rhythmic spirit anymore, but just to get the groupings, can you do one slur for every two bars? So, Okay, great. That actually had a very nice feeling in between those chords. We okay, try once more and just observe your timing, and then we're going to try to do same timing with the with the Boeings as they are.
Okay, and now just play it normally. Beautiful. Now, I don't know if you thought specifically this way um, or if um, your teacher or teachers have ever talked about this way, about stressing certain measures um, and not stressing as much certain beats. And um, what you did was you just did it naturally, probably without thinking about it, right? You didn't, did you think, oh, I'm gonna play less on the second bar? This, this time. This time, um, not really. Not really, right? Yeah, and that's actually the best way. That is when, um, sometimes when we're thinking too consciously about, it can kind of become a little artificial. We lose the long phrase. Uh, we're doing it in proportions that are not quite, um, don't feel so, so natural. And, this was just, this felt great. It felt freer and more rhythmic, if that makes, makes sense. That's what we would really love to have. Now, go on to the next, the, the whole sequence. And you really have to experience each bar, the harmony changing with this, these suspensions. Okay, we don't want to skip through any of those. Okay, how about try one, try that idea of slurring by the bar now. This is great. It's also, I have a feeling for you that it will be much more unnatural for you to, if you're grouping it like this, if you're slurring, it'll be much more unnatural for you to uh, play all the same. I don't think it would be possible for you to do that it's not, though, because you just respond to the music beautifully. With all these separate bows, it's easier to actually fall into that. Um, it's just more distracting us. There are more, so many different kinds of articulations going on. So the line you had this time was much more beautiful. Try to, try to do that with separate bows now. That was interesting. When you did slurred, I'm not that you can't do it differently, but when you did a slurred, you made basically a diminuendo. I don't know if you realized that. And then this time it seemed like basically you were making a crescendo. Mm. So was crescendo what you intended on doing? The in your performance, I don't even remember actually in your in your performance. I hadn't quite decided on. Okay. <laughs> it sounded more convincing when you did it slurred and when the this whole line just gently settled down to the to the resolution. This is the point where we're at most rest. Rest being relative. We're not really at rest. It's still pretty exciting. Um, but why don't you try that uh, once again? From da -da 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 -da. So um, there's a real soaring quality of when we. Uh, whenever we get that kind of long descending suspended line. Okay, now this rhythmically is much more grounded than our spinning and running and falling down, right? So if you can just feel each one of those, each one of those eighth notes, that you're not just easily falling through those bars. 
That's good. That's great. Um, it, it gives, it just makes your whole opening phrase, if we had heard you from the beginning now, I think it would have given a very eloquent ending to it um, before we, we change directions. As we said, this, this is really the closest thing we have to a stop in the entire movement. You know? So um, great, is this idea making sense to you? Overall, how it might apply to everything coming? Okay, that's, that's really great. And the, be very aware of the harmonic rhythm, how it's changing, so it's shifting. So if, uh, for instance, here, we're really going at just every two measures, nothing's happening, nothing significant is happening there harmonically. But then, We're gonna have this descending suspended line. And so we really want to feel each of those harmony changes, okay? So um, I said we would talk just a little bit about fingerings. Um, you're using mostly open strings. Um, I don't think you were using that many fourth fingers in, in scale passages. And I don't know if that was a conscious choice or just, a, Okay, it is a conscious choice. Um, if you are using open strings, those are great places to shift. You have an extra moment to, to shift. I wish I could remember the specific places now. Um, maybe we might pl have play at the dub from the double bar forward and play a little slower. Okay, dum ba dum bum ba dum bum bum ba da da. Good, good, good. So um, what Libby did here was really great. Um, my, my iPad just lost its battery, so I can't look at my music. <laughs> she did this. You did that, right? That's a really, really great place to shift. And then I think you could... You can shift the second position after those eight open A strings, uh, because those are, you reached it okay the first time, but then the second on the on the echo, you actually tried to really jump up in the middle, right? Is that what you did? I went to oh. two. Yeah, right, but you shifted, right? You didn't, you didn't reach. Um, reaching with, it's tough because we want to be up here in second position. Um, so I think to, and there were some other ones. Um, um, there were some other ones later in the second half where you might even, this kind of idea where we're doing an ascending scale and we can actually, the string crossing of that is much easier than the jump up. And at this tempo, we don't hear, we can very easily hide those, um, the change in the color. Um, if it were in the Sarabon, then it would be hopeless to change the, the color in a, in a scalar passage like that. Okay, so you can look for those. And then um, last thing about the string crossings. Show me where maybe one of the most awkward places is for you in the moment, in terms of the string crossings. But, yeah, that is really awful. <laughs> and, and tell everybody what, what is something that is really awkward about it. There are actually a few things, but. I think it's the combination of the slurred three um, semi quavers going across three strings 
and then also yeah the fingering is awkward i don't know i haven't found a better one i would i would consider just staying in first position and do that c sharp with the third finger That also, by the way, is, is something I saw you doing that kind of fingering a um, couple of times, but um, there were quite a few others where on the tri, uh, no, this is not a tritone, augmented and to not try to use the same finger crossing over strings, but trying to change, you know, to, to raise or lower that, that interval. Even because our third finger is essentially here on a G, if we do third finger here, it's going to tend to be um, flat. So we really have to raise that. So this really is very in tune. And same here, we're going to play that G again. So the constant opening and, and closing, it's great to be able to do, but if if you find in tempo um, you would rather not move, then you can use that, that kind of fingering a little bit more. Um, so fingering-wise, maybe this will help. Uh, inevitably, I think part of what Libius is struggling with is just the clarity, right? Clarity of not it, clarity of it seems like each note and not to blur it like this, right? And don't you find also just to make the first note speak is difficult? The the G string, the B flat. And um, I know I always used to when when I was first learning this, um, when I would try to make it clear, I'll bet Libya has experienced this too, that it, the tone would end up being a little pressed and therefore less clear even. Um, at fast speeds, uh, we just have less time to actively do something with our arm or with our hands, even, even our fingers, which is so sensitive. We just don't have much time. Not a, If it were even only just one of them, maybe we have hope. But then there are two more. And we're making this big jump as well. So in situations like this, we want to allow the bow to do as much of the work on its own, to, for the bow to make the string speaks more than our, our technique, you know, our ability to feel the string. So technique becomes find the part of the bow that's going to make it speak. Um, and it, uh, so on, if a string doesn't want to speak, it's because it's going to be too, um, too light, that means we just need to move lower in the bow and just start it here. And not only that, you're talking about all three strings, these strings too. These are not speaking either. So I would s try to start this whole passage here and you, you're going to have to play even lighter with your right hand. Um, otherwise it'll be too into the string. Try slowly, this is the last thing we'll do because we're out of time, but even lower in the book, try, try exaggerating even at the frog and think very light, uh, but it's going to have a lot of sound anyway. And don't go above the middle and then keep, keep traveling to the frog. Good. good, good, good. Okay, I mean, the sound is quite deep already, right? Maybe even more, uh, it's probably a little bit impractical to use this deep a sound at that tempo, but you search for where the right place would be to, to start that. I think for me, it would probably be about here. 
Sorry, this is buzzing. Um, and a lot of things in, in a movement like this, actually, I probably would have been an inch or two lower in the bow than, than you were and work less in terms of trying to make the bow speak. So, so you can experiment with that. Probably, hopefully, it will also free up your left hand too because a lot of these places where we're trying to shift, we're actually struggling with this to make the string speak. Um, okay, I'm sorry we're out of time, Libby. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Amazing how quickly the time goes, isn't it? It just kind of flies. Um, Libby, thank you so much for, for, um, for playing. And uh, Libby's not in school. You're just completely self-motivating right now. So... So well done putting yourself out there for something. Um, and I hope that you, you got a lot out of that. Thanks. Yes, thank you. So our next player is Franca and she kind of encapsulates all in her very own self what this class is about because she has studied in Germany and she's a student in Manchester, but also in Italy, but she's in Montreal right now. So um, <laughs> <laughs> she's got it all going on. Um, she's going to play the first moon of Prokofiev, uh, second concerto, G minor concerto. Great.
Bravo. Great job, Frank. I'm sorry that there's no piano. <laughs> it would be nice to have piano for this. But um, so are you in Montreal to study? Did you um, move I'm to sorry. Um, no, no, I'm actually from Montreal, so I'm just um, back home because of the coronavirus. I see. Okay. I'm actually from Plattsburgh, not far. Um, in, in New York, on the other side of the border. And when I was living there, so when I was a child, I studied in Montreal. Um, oh. I would go up there for lessons, so with Richard Roberts. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're up, up near my home. Anyway, um, yeah, Bravo, is this something, I'll, I'll ask you the same question as Libby, something you've been playing for a while? Um, or so I've new? never performed it, but I started to play like some months ago and I took it again some some weeks ago to start uh, like playing it again. So. Okay, okay, great. Um, well, as you are, are probably experiencing as, as anyone here, anyone else who's worked on this, uh, fingerings are really a problem for this, right? And uh, while there are so many it almost seems like a, a finite number of fingerings for a lot of things that are more idiomatic. Um, once we get into Prokofiev, and I think this concerto, even more than the, than the first concerto, even more than any of his other violin pieces, actually, as far as I'm concerned, um, something about a lot of the just the augmented intervals, maybe um, all these patterns that are getting same with a lot of that except sometimes it's up here right in, in fifths and there's kind of nothing that works really so so it's a never-ending search with um with this piece every piece is but this one i think in particular you you see five great violinists play this you study with five really wonderful teachers um, and you might see completely different ideas. So <clears throat> whether to cross strings or whether not to cross string, you know, whether to shift, I mean, in that passage, for example, um, you, I would say neither, I, I'm completely inconsistent. It's like sometimes for the, at the beginning, I like the sound of the, But I'm sure later places that I don't care about the actual tone, color, and it's more about being able to get over in time. Um, so keep playing with that. Um, you're making a a lot of a lot of your choices are successful at this point, <coughs> and the the way you the, your gaze should be is it bothering you? If it's bothering you at that particular point, then maybe look for something else at those points. If it's working, just just leave it. And so actually, can you give one example? Are there any specific places that you'd like to, to talk about in terms of the just fingering? I mean, this place is really hard. Like uh, what, we, what you just I'm sure, like the number 11, um, is, I'm just really struggling. I keep uh, practicing it, but it's really like, I mean, just really hard bit, maybe, I, yeah. Number 11 is where, right where I was playing? Oh, OK, OK. Why don't you play it slowly for everyone? Let's just deal with the first few bars. Okay. Hey, good, Franca. Yeah, let's just take just just that much. And actually, if you don't mind playing even a little closer um, to your camera for everyone, so that they can they can see and and and, and even a little slower. Um, There's a lot to process, especially for anyone who hasn't who hasn't played the piece. Um, so one thing, in addition to just what finger you're going to be using. Um, one thing that you really, in all the music you play, but in this piece, um, it's more vague because there's so many shifts, potential shifts of just one position 
right, going between first position and second position, or kind of in, even in between. So be really aware of, do I really need to shift or not? Or can I just reach this? Or can I find a place for my thumb that's just there instead of there? And this will allow me to play both positions to kind of swallow them whole. Uh, shifting takes time. Shifting takes time and effort. <laughs> and while it might feel like, um, first of all, extensions are not really extensions. If we never learned positions in the first place, there wouldn't be extensions, right? Um, even for people who think they have smaller hands, um, well, certainly for your, for your hand, um, most natural positions, even down here in first position, uh, there are things where, um, you know, let's put it this way, half steps are, are very uncomfortable. It's much more comfortable to have your hand open like this. And that, I mean, if my hand is open, it's almost first to third position like this. So, um, and once you're past third position or so, so what, playing, uh, it's actually very cramped, right? If we put our fingers down, it would be probably more covering a fifth. So, um, so open yourself up to, to that idea. Uh, let's do it again slowly. And you went up to three here, I think. Okay, so I would not actually shift with your thumb. I mean, you're just going up a half step and then you can kind of creep up somewhere. I would not shift. Kind of live somewhere between position 1.25 and 1.75 and that's all. <laughs> And yeah, do it slower. Yeah, okay, good, 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 good. Ah, uh, that was great. So, I mean, it was just better in tune. First of all, the more our thumb moves, the more we kind of have to guess where to put, drop our fingers, we, we lose our reference point, okay? It's like, um, kind of like being on a flying trapeze. You know, once you let go, then you, you're just somewhere and you gotta catch it again. And if we have that reference point, then actually, even though these are, I'm sure for, for most of you, this is a very foreign position, and this is a very foreign position, but it actually works if you do, if you try it. Try just this exercise without playing like I'm doing. Um, did we lose Franco there? Okay, we have you back. Um, and as when this is a fixed point, it's you're gonna be shocked at how safe it feels to find these intervals, like one, one, like this is so much more consistent than letting go, okay? We have to get good at letting go somewhat as well because we do have to shift around. Um, but I think that's why this was really um, kind of more razor sharp, your intonation was great. Um, the other thing that happens is when you're shifting, we drag our finger, we drag so... This was dragging, I mean, the first time. This time you were not, it's, so it's just quicker. And um, so working on it at this tempo is really the way to do it, And but then you're going to really enjoy it more. There was one. Somewhere around here, you did one shift that I heard that I think was unnecessary. Oh, okay. Avoid of try to avoid same finger. 
like uh, I can't remember now. What is? You think you did four, two, two, something like that? I did the four, two, two, one, but I think I I yeah. shifted a little bit too much. I like. Yeah, the let's tr you should I think at this speed try to avoid the same finger on slurs. It's just slower. Um, if you're separate bows, then we have more hope of just very lightly jumping. But on the slur, we can't jump really with our finger. It's no longer a slur. So I would just it was four three one. Try to just make that one position. You want to, as much as possible, if you have to shift, shift not on within the slur, but shift between the slurs yeah, on bow changes. Okay, so anyway, that's in a nutshell. I mean, this is this is definitely one of the passages, but even in, even in the slower singing passages as well. Um, something that you can and everybody can, I think, think ab about in this repertoire, a lot of Russian repertoire, um, especially 20th century Russian repertoire, when you're talking about the, the, the big composers being Prokofiev, Shostakovich, and Stravinsky, um, and there you would call all of them very rhythmic, powerfully rhythmic composers. Stravinsky may be one of the, the most rhythmic of all. And, uh, but I think the way they saw their music, let's say with Prokofiev, it almost feels at times like uh, there's certainly a, a very, a ballet quality to a lot of his music or a film score kind of quality to his music. Um, it's not just a, it's not a coincidence that Tchaikovsky also's ballet component in like most of his music, right? And as someone pointed out to me once, ballet, in ballet, if you're constantly changing the pulse, the dancers will fall over. They need a certain regularity. But also, let's say, even with film, the, the idea of this, there needs to be a certain motion of time, except in places that are just suspended, you know, atmospheric, that's different. Um, also, though, if you think about the, the, just the musical quality of a lot of this music, um, there's something, not in all, but there's some element, even at the beginning of this, something quite imposing about the way the music is coming at us right? Um, it's what makes it feel kind of menacing. It's not moving quickly. It's not a fast tempo, but it's almost like some gigantic force that's coming at you and you can't get out of the way. It just is coming with such regularity. So um, let's say just in general, uh, just being more attuned to that pulse and knowing that you're manipulating it, really knowing if you are manipulating it, that it doesn't happen by accident. Um, when you, in general, when you think about colder emotions, um, let's say less imaginative, less flight of fancy, less impulsive, less like you're um, fickle, less flirting, all these, these kinds of emotions are much more about uh, kind of whimsical timing, free, impulsive freedom, um, which is why something like this. And then we a lot of rubato. Can you imagine, can you imagine someone playing that very straight? It'd be very, very strange. Um, so play a little bit of the beginning of, of this for, for us doing all the coloring that you're doing that you were that you were doing in your in your run through but about just like you can't get out of the way of this gigantic menacing um something you know that that's it's imposing we're we're fearful and then there is the manifestation of that you know a few measures later
Okay, Franco, let's just take just that much even um, because we want to leave this with a, with a feeling of dread. It's almost worse, that dread. It's almost better when the, the storm comes, right? <laughs> There's something that's almost a relief. Um, so you're already... Da, da, da. This was really this time. I felt something immediately. And then there was a fancy something. It almost felt, um, it almost felt beautiful. It felt rather expressive. And how about it just stays and, and not, not late, not fast eighth notes, not so creative. Um, and, um, and not such a comma after da 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 even there there's a little breath but maybe not so much time just a little this all, you know, when we move a little forward and then therefore at other times we're pulling back, it gives, it allows the music to breathe. We don't want it to breathe here. This is like the air is still not moving. It's like suffocating. Right? Also, there are no dynamics, right? It's just mezzo piano, no crescendo, no hairpins, nothing. Yeah, and I think, not that that always means just it should be flat, but I do think in this particular case, there isn't a lot of profile to it yet. was better good uh, sorry I muted you that's not good <laughs> uh, I meant to mute myself um, that was better already uh, it was with expression there's some you know when we talk about natural expression more natural expression I think that's when our playing reflects the line and the harmony in a way that we just, that would be no most, that would be easiest to feel. Um, it'd be the way we sing happy birthday at someone's party. It's just, right, we, we don't think about it. We just sing happily. There's no resistance to it. We're not holding anything back. When something is overjoyed or overwrought, those, um, emotions are really at the extreme, even on the positive side, is maybe where we experience it even more. So happy birthday, we ex really explode up there. Um, when it's muted or stifled, that's where the music wants you to open up, but we don't. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear whoever. <laughs> it, and you refuse to open up the way you would feel inclined. That, I think, it results in this, it, it, like here, this, this feeling of maybe being empty, cold. Um, so how about, da, 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 this was great, da, 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 da. and then because it rises, because it changes strings, because actually we use more bow all of a sudden on those quarter notes, da, 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 it tends to just open up. Not you, but I mean, just it's just the way it works on the violin. So how about? Da, 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 da. Let's try that. You don't have to use your whole bow. <laughs> Thank you. 
Ned open up. A little bit, right, right, right. Then that, uh, uh, but actually you don't even have to open up there. But the first few meshes were, there was something really kind of magnetic about it. If, if, if I were hearing you, I think for the first time, it actually would have been strangely compelling. I would think, oh my gosh, this is a disturbing, kind of disturbingly dark person. Uh, but it would make me, it would make me listen. I mean, and that's what this opening should be. Um, it should not just be presented just easily and, and openly. So uh, that was really, really great. If you can, now the next section, the da da bum 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 is really a march. March also doesn't move really. Da ba 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 ya da da da. That the triplet triplets here can so easily ya ba 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 ya ba ba ba. Brum bum cold na na. Rounding off, but and then the cannon with the cello between the cellos and and us, and that that can't be free because we're moving in, in kind of in parallel rhythm just to two quarter notes later. So um, into each section. Um, no, not, not moving ahead, not pulling back anywhere. And you see how rhythmic the right is kind of like Beethoven. Um, there's this motion, all this, this. We have all the rhythmic stuffing in there, even in our. Um, it's very ballet. The orchestra just. They just keep going simply like that. If that has to move around a lot, then the music is not so simple anymore. Um, there's not, this is like, it's kind of could be a Romeo and Juliet scene. It's not, it's a very innocent love scene. The way. Um, so next section, the dom, the orchestra is da da ba da ba da ba da ba da very obsessive. Okay. So your tempo can and should between those sections vary, um, but maybe within the section it doesn't vary quite as much. So I'm sorry we have to stop. It was a pleasure, <laughs> pleasure to pleasure to hear you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. I've forgotten we, how much I absolutely love that piece. And it's interesting, Suvin, last week we had uh, the Brahms, Tchaikovsky, and Sibelius violin concertos all in one evening. It's great. <laughs> Um, and one of the things that came up was this feeling of, of um, you know, the orchestra does their thing and then they land and then the violin takes off on these flights of fan fantasy in each of those pieces. Um, Sibelius a little bit differently because it, it, it starts right in with it. But I was just thinking as, as you were talking about this opening, how it's, what, it's like, what, 50, 60 years after Brahms' concerto? Not, not that long. And suddenly we're just right in it from the, from the very first note and how, how incredibly magical that opening is mm -hmm. in a sort of, it's fun. I've never thought of it as that foreboding. I think it, Prokofiev writes the most beautiful melodies for the violin, um, but it's, it is disturbing. And that mezzo piano is weird. I've, I had to download the music because I don't play this piece. And I was like, mezzo piano started. <laughs> yeah. What does that mean? That many pieces start with mezzo piano or mezzo, mezzo anything. <laughs> mezzo to like, that. Although, yeah. <laughs> well, but it's, and I think it's, it's especially, um, it puts into context the, the later statement that we were talking about where it's in canon with the, with the cellos. Ironically though, that's piano, but the whole cello section is not, Maybe the basses are even playing there. It's not piano. It's massive, even when they play softly. And um, so, our opening mezzo piano, I think, should it's it kind of it's all relative. It actually should not be. We can't think of it as we will be a little softer later. But we have to have enough presence at the opening so that later on doesn't sound much louder. Actually, so. 
Yeah, amazing, amazing piece. I remember the first time I heard it on, on recording, it was an Oistrakh record at yeah. home. I, I didn't know anything about, I, I just, my parents just had it and I just put it on. And and I, th I remember thinking the same thing. It was so weird. What, the violin's playing at the beginning alone? I, I really remember thinking, this is just odd because I never, that wasn't what we do. That isn't what we do normally. Yeah. So. All right, okay. well, we should move on to Alec, who's going to play some Izai for us. And this is a great connection because Alec's teacher was in school with me and Suvin in Cleveland. So um, we have Alec playing some Izai Obsession and uh, the first movement of the second Izai Sonata. Okay. And I wonder, would it be, maybe it would be worth to, to ask people if you have questions to write them in the chat? Yeah. Uh, because, and we also might have a little more time. That, and this is this is a shorter movement, so maybe towards the end of this, we'll have some time to address some questions too. Great. So that's. Okay. Bravo, Alec. So, so and now I've been trying to guess who is your teacher. <laughs> who is your teacher, Alec? Joe Nardolillo. Oh, that's right. Okay, that I saw that earlier. Joe said, "Great. Oh, it's such a pleasure to hear you." And how old are you, Alec? I'm sixteen. Well, I'll be sixteen in two weeks. So I'd like to say I'm sixteen now. <laughs> <laughs> Good. We'll round up. And have you played other Yizai sonatas? No, this is my first one. Okay, great. Are you enjoying it? Yeah, yeah. And have you worked on any other movements yet? Yes, I am working on the rest of it with, with, along with this movement. Okay, okay, good. Well, in, um, it's a very special piece. I have to, uh, I have to admit, I didn't really like it very much until more recently. I played it quite a bit when I was younger, but I just, I don't know, I didn't connect with it. And, and I have a, quite a different perspective for it now. And 
I am enjoying it more. Putting in the context of this set of six sonatas, this is, maybe you can, as you're listening, and certainly as you're studying these in the future, maybe you can um, listen to them from this perspective and see if, you know, 10 years from now, you can tell me whether you agree with me or not. But I find them overall um, on the objective side that they're not, that they are incredibly, at times, incredibly brilliant, um, virtuosic, exciting, fiery, but all in a more objective way, almost like a, a storytelling way, let's say, like the ballad. I mean, that, that the title there says it. Um, number five, Aurora, um, also just the, the implication of nature there. Um, rather than, okay, I'm expressing my own feelings. Okay? Um, there are parts of the ballad, I think, that um, have a little bit more of that. Um, but this one, also indicated by the title, um, Obsession, I think this is actually very personal. Um, it's like really showing, um, even the name aside, I mean, I'm not fixating on the name, I think just the writing, um, there is something um, so powerful about this. And um, it is indicated in, in Mark is so many accents and hairpins and sudden dynamic changes. Even the crescendos are so, sometimes sudden, um, not just um, subito pianos. And, and it just continues, doesn't let you breathe. Right, um, even the, even the place where we come back in the middle to C major, it's so odd that we've all just gone back to this um, this happy memory, and but even that, I find there's so much drama in there, and especially in the rests, which you're doing really well about feeling the rests. Um, I think so. Let's try a little bit from the beginning again. And what if you try to put a little bit more of, let's say this is an obsession, not a happy obsession, but kind of a, a pain, an, an obsession that is stuck in your head and you just desperately want it out. Okay. You and, and you're aggravated and suffering because of it. Mm -hmm. Let's stop. Let's let's stop there, Alec. So good. A lot of things better. Let me just open up the music. Um, were you here for um, when we were talking about um, the the Prokofiev just before this? You were okay. In the beginning, yes. In the beginning, how about the part where we we're talking about the opening and and, and um, when music is stifled? versus when it opens up naturally. Maybe you were warming up, right? Okay. Yeah. We're, so we're, we're talking about um, when you have a, an, an emotion, an expression of ease, then the line is at the harmonies and, and the, also the melodic line is doing kind of what comes most naturally and easily without effort. And from there, um, more strained emotions are deviating from that in one direction or another. Let's say you, you have um, 
So instead of joyful, if you're extremely joyful, like overexcited, then your lines, your dynamics would be much more exaggerated. And on the other hand, if it feels cold, that it would be exaggerated in the other direction, in not doing much at all. Um, <coughs> so this is pretty intense, right? Not easy. Um, so say, take those, those dynamic changes and um, more extreme. Let's say you have these marcato accents. More marcato and more accented. And then less. That the piano can be more otherworldly, even those accents not as pointed as the the marcato accents. Okay, um, try that from. How about from? Okay, can you try the piano? That's better. Can you try the piano slowly? Well, like this. And can you make this almost indistinct? Okay, just a, like a, 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 a mist, a fog. Not, not clear, not real. And even the, the accent that it's not so pointed, fuzzy. That's great, okay. That is getting to really extremes. And it's not even that it was so soft. That was what was great about it. Um, Dynamically is only marking mezzo forte and piano. It's not a gigantic difference, but if you play it like that, and if you play the mezzo forte the way you played that last note just now, um, going to be completely different worlds, <coughs> which I think is is kind of the point here. The this is on the front of our minds, and this is like in a dream state. And it's going back and forth, um, just switching between these. Okay? Um, so if you apply this um, everywhere, you can imagine how much more dramatic all of this is going to be. Um, so that was really great already. Um, make sure that your timing is not by accident. <clears throat> let's say when you are, you're taking time a few places. Um, want to make sure it's, it's because you really musically want to, for example, okay. If you, now if you are slowing down and kind of relaxing because you really want to, that's fine. It doesn't sound like you really want to though. It feels like you're kind of doing it because you're getting closer to the frog and yeah, it won't go any faster. Is that possible? <laughs> it's possible, right? Okay, so I know here that's, that's a particular issue. Well, the so first answer is, is it's comp this is the process you should go through in, in your practicing. It's harder to do when you get closer to the frog, right? Okay, so we don't want to get closer to the frog, at least not so early. Okay, so instead of trying to get better at it here, let's try to get better at playing the first few up here. And so after, and start it here. And then you're, you're gonna find it so much easier to, this will be the bottom, not down, down here. Try that slowly. 
And let's start that note, not even here. If you start it here, it's hard to get to the tip, right? So somewhere in the middle, just below the middle. And then you have to articulate those first few. Okay, that's good. <coughs> Don't worry about the last part yet. Let's let's get good at the first part. And it's really make sure we bite that first one. Okay, if we are not so clear here, then we're sunk for the entire bow. So it's good to actually practice it really exaggerated at first. If you can even do it like in that much bow then this will be a relief. Okay, try that. Okay, it's good, good, good. Now, the <coughs> now the reason that those bottom notes are harder, it's where our whole arm position is. A good way of practicing this is just do those last four, just on the G string. Yeah, much easier, right? And that means if we don't get to here with our, you know, the way we, we get up there from the shoulder, if our elbow is not at that level, if it's here, it's not going, or it, this is even worse, then it does, it does this, jams. Uh, so do it once more. Okay, now add two D string notes to that. Ba, 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 ba. Okay, better, better. You have to anticipate the new string, okay, with your arm. If it looks like da 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 you know it's not going to work. It should look like very gradually. So when you're crossing strings, there's hardly any motion because we're almost to the G string. It's just in one arc. Okay, maybe the whole class can see, the whole class can see how far your elbow is moving when you cross to the G string, it's going from about here to here, suddenly. We want it to go here to here, only that much, which means you need to be closer to the G string. That's right, 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 right. This is, okay, this is, this is the D string. And I can go anywhere from here to here still on the D string. It's a huge range from one side of the string to the other side of the string. So not just when you're doing staccato, but in general with string crossings, um, we want to be as close as, as possible. So we don't see any bumps. That's when we have a chance of really connecting. Try it now, how about <coughs> medium tempo? That's already better, okay? And then for everyone to, to remember that the closer we come to the frog, the more the bow is going to grab the string, it's gonna bounce all by itself. It should feel like we're, hard, like we're playing legato here with our arm. If you try to go into the string and articulate, it's already, it's just too much. So we want to go from really articulating to almost legato. And that's what it's going to, just going to all sound very, very clear. Okay. Um, I think ideally, because we've had all these rests, yeah. 
as you did. They were dramatic. Finally. I think finally, let's get going. Ideally. Um, I wouldn't slow down to a little relief. How about just keep going. Don't let people breathe now. Um, any kind of perpetual motion movement we should really think about that aspect. The point of perpetual motion is to not rest, you know, and, and that's kind of what is so exciting about it. Um, good. In also, in general, try to find the part of the bow and that's going to do the stroke you want, especially when you're talking about something like spiccato at the very opening. Okay, that's the last thing we can do is. Um, I think you're in a you're you're in a part of the bow that is difficult for you to make that stroke and the dynamic that you want. Okay, try that opening again. Just the first two measures. Okay, can we get lighter? He writes leggero. He even writes it kind of parenthetically. Um, this is not real. Okay. Okay, now this is almost like a contradictory marking, I feel like. He writes point, but then he writes these dots on every single note, knowing that there are no dots at the beginning of it in, in Bach's version, doesn't mean that they need to be long, that there would not have been dots because Bach wasn't writing dots on his notes to indicate shorter. Um, however, Coming from Izai, one of the greatest violinists in history, knowing the instrument so well, it's so glorious about his writing, his, his technical markings, they, they're so easy to understand. Um, they just make musical sense that he marks dots on the 16th notes and leggero that would, would Izai, write dots wanting it like that, I can't imagine. So I think he wanted something very, really, really kind of strange, unusual. Okay, let's just, those first three notes. Actually, don't even, play uh, uh, D sharp, just three E's. Okay, don't, don't try to do it. Okay, you're, what you're gonna do is just play a down bow, an up bow and a down bow, except you're gonna drop it, that's all. Yeah, you're, okay, so every, probably everyone can, can also um, see your hand. And if the hand looks like this, that means there's grabbing, okay? It, this, this must grab. If it's relaxed, it's just going to look like this. I don't know if it, this, this, this is gonna flex a little. Okay, last, last thing we'll try, because this is, this is something you can work on with your teacher. This is really, it's, it's about trust. We, a, 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 a stroke like this will never work if we're controlling the bow. It's, it should feel like you let go and it just bounces back up. And maybe with your teacher, actually, you can try putting it here and let go of the pinky and you'll see it just drops without doing anything with the rest of your arm, okay? And certainly not with all of your fingers trying to push the bow into the string, okay? So you can try that exercise. Really, it's just 
three times, kind of like this. It's the same as ricochet. Okay, it's the exact same as that, except instead of two down bows, we're just going down, up, down. Okay. But there's something about the bow change that definitely makes it very natural for us to want to hold on more. This is it's easier for us to feel. Okay. Um, so this is, this is a weird sound, but it's still about getting to the part of the bow that will make that sound, and then just don't try to control it much at all. Okay. Uh, there was a, okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for playing for us, Alec. There was so, a- So sorry, was, we're out of time for everything. Um, Franca has a great question that maybe we can come to, can we come to after Vivian plays? Sure, of course. I think that would be a good question to answer. And I just have to tell you, Suvan, that stroke, it, about when you play Isai, you really are struck by, I mean, the greatest violinist probably ever in, in some ways, um, writing this stuff out and being so incredibly specific about where to block your fingers and what, you know, <clears throat> all these things. And sometimes when you're learning it, you're like, oh yeah, I just have to do what's written and then I can, I can actually play it. But other things like this, like he knew what playing at the point with a, a dot on every note yeah. would be like. And it rem just reminded me, and Alec, you're such a good sport for doing it, because that is, Suvin makes it look easy, but it's, that's a really hard thing to trust will work. And I was in a master class once um, playing Opus 132, which has a very similar marking at the end of the finale where Beethoven writes something very fast and articulate to be played at the point and no one does it everyone does it in the middle of the bow and it's you know you're tired you've been playing for 45 minutes no one does that and Norbert Brannan of the Amadeus Quartet made our quartet do it at the point and he just started roaring with laughter <laughs> <laughs> because it was such a disastrous attempt I mean he just was he was a large guy and he just was was um it, it made him laugh very hard. So sometimes um, that that is uh, worth it as well. But um, I, just really quickly, you raised, I think, such an important point for us. These are not instructions that we have, whether it's what Beethoven wrote or what it's, whether it's Yisai with all these wonderful violin um, indications, let's say. Um, but these are not rules. These are not like traffic signs, like a stop sign or something. Then, you know, you, you stop. Like that's what you're supposed to do. Um, these are for us to interpret, to try to understand um, what is behind the marking. Ultimately, with any great composer, it's not a technique just for the sake of being a technique. There's an expression behind it. And definitely with composers, living composers that I've worked with, um, if we get the expression with a different technique, they are thrilled. Um, on the other hand, if you do the technique they indicate and it's not the expression they want, they're so frustrated. So um, the most important thing to do is, is start by you know, what they might indicate in the instruction, especially if it's Yizai, but then try to understand what is behind it. What is the sound that he actually wants? And then actually you might get more of that sound doing a different technique and, and be open to that. Okay, so we should yeah. just do some chasson, right? We should do some chasson. And, okay. um, and Vivian sent us the whole thing, but I'm afraid we're gonna have to cut it off because it's just, it's a big work and I wanna make sure we have time, but this is absolutely one of my favorite pieces of music, the, the chasson poem. Thank mm -hmm.
Bravo. Do you go? Did you say Vivian, Cecily? You go by Vivian. Yes, I go by Vivian. Okay, okay. Um, it's really, really beautiful. And where are you now? I'm in San Francisco. Right okay, now. and are you studying there as well? Yes, I study with Ian Swenson and Chen Zhao. Oh, great. Okay. Say hi to um, both of them okay. uh, from me. Old, old friends and yeah. both wonderful, wonderful teachers, wonderful musicians. Um, and where are you from originally? Uh, I studied in Shanghai Conservatory before I came to the States. And how long have you been in the U.S.? Eight years. Eight years, okay. Yeah. Well, your English is so good, so <laughs> but maybe you have been here for a while. Um, well, very beautiful playing. And is this a piece that you have been, you're fairly familiar with? Have you performed it um, before? I started like um, before the summer break. Before summer break. Okay. Well, it's really already very, very beautiful. It seems to suit you. Um, but also you're just um, doing just a lot of really wonderful things. Um, I mean, as everyone here knows, to have a really beautiful sound quality, um, either streaming or even just recording on the devices that we have is these days is not easy. And so um, I really commend Vivian that just the, for the quality of the sound, the beauty of the sound was really wonderful. Um, one thing that maybe you can think a little bit about is when you are trying to sing through notes, I think your bow is singing through it beautifully. I mean, you're, you're you're staying through the string if you want the sound quality not to release that's great you keep the bow moving so the sound keeps ringing um, and developing in that way your vibrato tends to which and i think your vibrato is beautiful but your vibrato tends to at many of those moments when you're trying to sing through notes it it relaxes okay. um, that you have a, so part of that is, I mean, for everyone, part of that is a really getting a really nice impulse at the beginning of the note. Okay, mm -hmm. so Vivian's vibrato uh, was not doing this and then going in and then like this. Um, she was really, do and then ya, right from the beginning of the note. But sometimes when we get that wonderful impulse at the beginning, it's easy to, to die with it as da, ya, da. and mm. if you can keep it singing through into the next note that will make your phrases even longer let's just try that phrase that da, 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 da. Okay, good. That's, that's already a good start. So we'll a hairpin, a hairpin up that way for you um, with your vibrato specifically, not with your bow so much. No, nothing more with your bow, but that the vibrato is going to open up into the next note all the time. Okay, oh, maybe. let's try just the first two notes now. It's, you're, I, you're doing a very good job of, of trying. Um, it's hard to do it in tempo. <laughs> um, so let's just do D into E flat <coughs> and think of the end of the D as being your widest vibrato. That's right. That's great, right. Um, I don't know if that, does that feel quite different yeah. from what you, you have to, it's almost going opposite, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, it really makes the notes sing into the, the next, not just in terms of the sound keeps going, but the, the expression keeps developing. Right? There was 
very, very slightly, there was this moment of, oh, and then a little bit either of, of a relaxing like this or even stopping right before the, the first note. And, and if you can think of that on every note, into the next note. Now, even when you are da, da, ya, yes, there's a kind of a, an ebb and flow, relaxation there, mm -hmm. right? But because this is um, a habit you want to turn around, um, you know, your bow is making, in other words, your bow is doing a beautiful job of making that shape. So I would, with your left hand, continue to always try to develop it, open it out. So I think a, a good way of thinking about it is that it's the widest. Sometimes if we think it's the fastest at the end of the note, that can make us a little bit tight. Yes. So when we think about it's the widest, it opens us, opens up. Mm -hmm. um, so then my next question um, for you, or the question I had for you is, what, do you have any specific questions about something in your playing, either in general or maybe in a, that comes out in a specific place in the chanson that you played? Um, I was struggling a bit to um, create it, create the longer phrase because mm -hmm. I think I think the vibrato thing was one of one of them that definitely would help mm -hmm. to make it the phrase longer, um, and also bow change i feel like sometimes i struggle a little bit um to create a really smooth bow change mm -hmm. to make the phrase longer well yeah. probably this is related probably yeah. um if you're and maybe uh, you know what it's possible that and this is for everyone when we focus on one thing uh, sometimes other things go and mm -hmm. if you're focusing on the bow change so much that your vibrato might not have been singing through as much. And then what happens is we just hear the bow change more and more. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's less ring. Uh, and uh, so maybe um, two perspectives. The smooth, first of all, smooth bow changes are overrated. I think. <laughs> um, smooth bow changes, sometimes, yes, we want to be able to do. However, um, we need to be able, we need to articulate things as well. Doesn't mean articulate in, in a crunchy way or in a dry way, um, but when we're, when we're singing, let's say a singer is singing a song, their words are still articulated. Even if their voice is legato, yeah. um, the, the consonants at the beginning of the words need to be articulated. And, and sometimes in an effort to smooth everything out, we actually lose that. So um, I would say this, that playing smooth bow changes is the exception, first of all. So maybe that'll relieve you a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But then second of all, uh, not hearing the bow change as much is not just about trying to hide the beginning of the next note, but it's about creating so much ring around the end of the previous note that the the next note doesn't bother us or the next bow change doesn't bother us. So don't you feel if you're playing in a very resonant hall, don't you feel like, oh, my bow changes are smoother? Yeah. Right? Yeah, they're not smoother. <laughs> they're the exact same, but it sounds like they're smoother because there's all of this wonderful um, reverb. Mm -hmm. So which is extending the, the ring of the notes we just played. So that's kind of what we're talking about is, is make your vibrato create that reverb. Mm -hmm. and, and then you're, it's not going to bother you as much, the, the next note. Same, by the way, with shifts. It's very, very intuitive for us um, to think that in order to make a clean shift, that we have to let go of the previous note. Mm -hmm. and But if we let go of the previous note, then that note is not ringing anymore. And then we're, there's this hole and we're gonna hear the shift. So instead, if you 
actually hold down that previous finger as long as possible and then just shift lightly, but don't release this early, um, then actually you feel like you have more time for the shift because that note is ringing um, and you just, you don't hear. You just don't hear as much because all you're hearing is your great sound all the time. So, um, so that's a, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's a great, great question. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer a couple of questions that people typed in, if you don't uh, you. mind, which are both great questions. Oh, first, maybe the um, Alex's question about fourth fingers. So then, um, do, you, do you mind reading the question out? Because sure. Because on YouTube won't be able to see these soon. Okay. Um, as mentioned earlier, there are many fingering options in the Prokofiev. Sometimes it's easier to extend rather than shift. Do you have any advice for people with short fourth fingers and suggest a few stretching exercises? Well, I guess if you, first of all, there's so many advantages that people have who have smaller hands and slightly shorter fingers. Um, there are a lot of disadvantages. I, have, I happen to have big hands and long fingers and um, the violin is not meant actually to be played in general by someone who has like big hands. You know, I would probably would fit the cello much better um, because here the, the violin is in, in, our, in our palm, sort of in our thumb. And it would be so great to just be able to just drop the fingers and they land right where I want them to land. But my fingers are already past the G string. It's not where I want to land. Um, G string is okay. By the time you get to E string, I mean, it's like my fingers are pulling in like this. It's, there's no room left. So it's constantly trying to create room. And um, there's a certain size and proportion of hands, smaller hands that um, where you can just put the finger down and it's just beautifully in the most beautiful spot for a really juicy sound. Okay. Now, of course, this is easier for me. Now, um, maybe fingered octaves or something like that. Maybe some extensions like this might be, and reaching over strings, like getting over to the G string is easier. Um, however, really what long fingers do and long, long hands is allow you to play those things with not as good technique. Um, you can get away with having your fourth finger kind of all the way over here. And uh, you, can, you can still kind of get over there. People with short fourth fingers, no hope. So, but for everyone, I know this because I had, I changed at some point to bring everything around more. So you're basically playing in this position where your fingers are lined up one string and being lined up the G string is a really good place to start because you know most people when you think about extending it's over there right we're not extending back here so um, we tend to be in this position especially if you're grabbing the the neck with the side of your index finger see what that now my fingers are falling off the edge so once we're free of that then we're starting to be able to get over there. And if you do have, so if you do have shorter fourth fingers or smaller hands, there is still most things in, in the standard repertoire, you're not going to have a problem getting to if you're more in this position. So it's just um, stretching exercises, yet, or maybe not even stretching exercises, but exercises to find what position to be in you want your thumb to generally be in the position where your fourth finger is, if you're in third position here, and reach back. Not first position and reach up, you won't make it. But this will be really shocking to you if all of you try this. Um, I'm not even talking about second position, to first, but even third position. Our index finger can go way back. All of these fingers go way back from the thumb, but our fingers don't go very far up from the thumb. Um, and then the other question was from Franca about practicing, manage and organizing practice. <coughs> practice everything every day or separate the pieces. Um, well, 
in general, every day. Um, and in general, but whatever you're practicing at that general moment in those days or those weeks, that you do that every day. So which means you don't try to take too much repertoire at a time. Um, it's possible, here's a, an example, Tchaikovsky Concerto, just as a pile of notes and just so many notes to practice, so much music to learn. And it's possible to, you know, I've had students say, they learn the exposition and then they kind of get okay with that. So then they go on to the next section and they're not really addressing the first part. And then they go on to the next section and all of a sudden, you know, two months later, you're towards the end of the first movement, but you haven't practiced the, the opening for six weeks because how can you? It's, it's too many hours in a day, right? Unless you're just running through everything and, and um, that's probably not addressing a lot of problems. So, um, and it's then possible you just get into this loop. If you find like you're working on one piece for just month after month after month, um, I just saw someone the other day who said that they've been working on the first movement of Tchaikovsky for a year. Um, first of all, just move on. <laughs> Learn more, learn another piece, learn more music. You can come back to the piece later in your life. But um, that to me is indicative of trying to learn too much of the piece at once. So the less you practice more consistently, the faster it really goes deeper into you, um, the way we learn it. And so let's say the exposition of Tchaikovsky Concerto, if instead of spending two weeks on it, you spend four weeks on that and not doing anything else later in the piece, um, and you're just, which gives you more time slowly with that much, then what will happen is you can move on, don't drop it, but spend less time on it and use the time that you're not practicing them that to, to keep moving forward. Um, and that's, I think, the, the general idea with learning music. Now, when you're doing um, gigantic recital programs or in uh, Cecily, what she mentioned was two gigantic programs, or if you're doing some international competition uh, and rounds of music, then uh, a lot of it just has to be so familiar. Uh, it has to be stuff that you've performed in the past many, many times. Um, it's Otherwise, there's just no way that that you'll be able to, to manage all of it. So um, if you try to do that and you're really, you'll be so stressed, um, just know that the last thing I'll leave you with is there's a really great story I heard about Frank Peter Zimmermann, um, who when I grew up hearing him, it just seemed like he could do anything, just such a whiz on, on the violin. And I heard years later uh, from people who are around him, who knew him, who worked with him, played in, played chamber music with him, that at some point in his life, he got wise and he decided he was not going to record a concerto until he had performed it 40 times with orchestra. So you see this, this towering, gigantic violinist, the reason he sounds great is because he sticks with it. And he knew after 35 times, it still doesn't feel, it still doesn't feel as good as he wants to. And, and he must have had bad experiences earlier in his life where he just didn't feel good in the recording. Um, now you listen to his recording and you think, wow, that sounds amazing. Well, the reason it sounds amazing is he did it for <laughs> did it 40 times. <coughs> so it just does take that, that kind of persistence. Um, and then it, it really does start to stick. So. It was a pleasure, pleasure to, um, bravo to everyone who played today. And thank you all for joining us and great questions. And I'm sure I'll see all of you somewhere sometime, hear you again somewhere sometime. Thank you so much for your time, Steven. It's amazing to see you and, and, and hear you and, and just get what you have to say. Really great. Um, I'm going to make just a little bit of an announcement about the future of the really big class. Um, we will keep going through the summer. Uh, I've put together a GoFundMe campaign for summer session of the really big class. 
And so far it's raised enough money for at least two classes in July. And I have an amazing list of people that I will be contacting over the next few days. So look for that announcement of who will be teaching in July. Uh, next week we have Elizabeth Kufarath. Uh, she is an amazing violinist, violist. She's in the Tetzlaff Quartet. She teaches in Hanover. And we've heard a number of her students so far, so I look forward to seeing her and, and hearing her teach again. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for, your, for supporting and, and being here and listening. Tell your friends, tell your family, tune in next week, catch the YouTube stream, and uh, see you next week. Hey, good luck to everybody. Stay well. Thanks. Bye.